So we're continuing on this sermon series, The Struggle is Real. If you've been with us, you know that it finds its um, foundation in a passage in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that talks about the spiritual forces of evil that we contend with as Christians. Um, A reminder that there is very real evil in the world and that we are called to identify it and to refuse to partner with the evil as it's manifested in this world. And so far as we've gone through the series, I know I have been um, surprised, and maybe you have been too, to be reminded that evil doesn't look like um, it does in the cartoons of our youth. It's not uh, a little demon on one shoulder and an angel on the other. It's not uh, like we see portrayed in medieval art with a Satan that has hooves and horns and a, and a pitchfork, that it's not um, really, it doesn't look like um, the modern um, versions we see in our media and movies and television, but that evil, when manifested in the pages of Scripture, when we read about when Satan is active in our world, it is often a lot more subtle and it looks a lot different than maybe what we would think of at first glance. So today we're going to talk about the idea of being sifted, and that's because we're going to look at a passage of Scripture, just a few short verses from Luke's Gospel in chapter 22, and we'll go ahead and get to that right now, verses 31 to 34. Jesus is speaking here, and this is near the conclusion of what we call today the Last Supper, the meal Jesus is eating with his followers and his friends before he begins the long road to the crucifixion. We read this. Jesus speaking says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me. You'll deny three times that you even know me. So we're going to get to the idea of what it means to be sifted in just a moment. But before we get there, I just want to explore briefly the context in which Jesus says these words, because it's important to note what is happening here at the Last Supper. What did the disciples just hear about mere moments before Jesus pronounced upon them this sifting that is to come, right? At the Last Supper, Jesus talked to his disciples about the fact that they were invited in to a new covenant, and a new kingdom. Jesus held the bread and the cup, and he said, this is the new covenant. This is my body broken. This is my blood poured out, and you are invited into a new covenant. Now, you can't imagine how exciting this would be for some young Jewish men, right? Because the covenant, covenants were huge things. Covenants were for people like Abraham and Moses, that they would be invited into a new covenant was extremely exciting. But then on top of that, Jesus even said, and now I'm conferring to you a new kingdom. Wow, what a day. A new covenant and a new kingdom all at the same time. And so it's right on the trail of these words that Jesus then says, Satan has asked to sift you. So is this sifting that Satan is asking to do, is this a response from the enemy who sees what God intends to do through his people and wants to thwart that effort? Is it a counter move to the move? And maybe if that's true, maybe this is God's counter move to the counter move of saying, my people are ready for this. And he is going to use this sifting as a preparatory function for what comes. If Jesus knows that this new kingdom and the new covenant are coming, maybe this sifting is a part of the process he will allow in order for them to be ready for the new things. I would put it this way. When we're struggling with suffering that can't be easily explained, it may be coming to us because God plans to do something new through us. These disciples stand on the cusp of something new. New covenant, new kingdom, but there will be struggle. And maybe this struggle is part of the way God will prepare them for the new thing that he is going to do through them. So then we get to the idea of the actual sifting. Now, most of the time today when we, when we, sifting was this idea of shaking something, right? 
In ancient times, to sift something was a process of shaking it in order to separate things. Now, when we shake things today, it's usually with the idea of actually mixing them together. I know that on uh, the mornings when I'm able to uh, exercise before I come into work, I make a protein shake. And what do I do? I fill this bottle with a liquid. I put in the protein powder and I shake it. I'm wanting to combine those things together. Sifting is a shaking that's intended to do exactly the opposite. It is a shaking that is intended to separate things out, right? And, and in ancient days, people would have understood this. We don't really understand it. Anybody sifted anything recently? Probably not. Oh, so I see one hand out there. I'm assuming like flour, sifting flour, is that a thing that still gets sifted on occasion, right? I, I will be honest, the last thing I remember sifting was um, I was in a turtle-shaped sandbox as a very, very young boy, and I was sifting sand and finding all of the, well, dead bugs and general debris and discarded chewing gum that you might find in a sandbox. So we, we are not well-versed in sifting. But in ancient times, this was a very, very common thing. They would have this tool that they would then shake And we learned that the shaking wasn't nice and easy. It was a violent shaking, the purpose of which was to break off the useful part of the wheat from the chaff, from the stuff that was not useful, to get the usable grain and be able to discard the unusable part. I had a friend in Simplicity Service. He said, oh, it's like black walnuts. I was like, what now? I don't, and so, so this person helped me out. He then even went and gathered some for me. He said, black walnuts, first of all, you start with this green outer shell type thing. And he said, you start with a wheelbarrow full of these type things, right? And you need to peel off this green part, right, that eventually becomes black. And he said, once you do that, you then end up with these things. And he said, you go from a, a, a wagon or a wheelbarrow full to maybe a five-gallon bucket full, and then you need to get rid of the outside of that to get to the actual walnut, the actual part that's meaningful, he said, that's about the size of your thumbnail. And you end up with a very small, you know, cup size. But then he said to me, but do you realize... Whoop. That's for you. Oh, you can't be on my team for Turkey Bowl this year. But then he said, do you realize how much more valuable that thing you have at the end is? When you go through the sifting or the peeling or whatever you want to call it, what you have left is so much more valuable and so much more useful. And I thought, man, I'm going to use that. It's such a picture of what God is doing. Amos chapter 9, verse 9, God himself speaks of using this process. He says, I will give the command and I will shake the people of Israel among the nations as grain is shaken through a sieve. Again, today, sifting isn't something we're familiar with, but what about phrases like this? What if someone said to you, I'm going to tear you to pieces, or I'm going to pick you apart? It's the same sort of emotional weight that we have here when Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you, right? It's really to find out how much of Peter's trust in Jesus is truly genuine and valid, and how much of Peter's trust in Jesus is really about the allure of following a popular rabbi, or maybe this idea that Jesus is going to establish this imminent earthly kingdom that Peter gets to be a part of. The shaking that's happening is to find out where where will Peter's faith be? Will it be something that is usable and valuable, or will it be something that blows away in the wind? Peter could have been following Jesus for any number of reasons. And at this point, he has this belief that Jesus is Messiah. But I also have to believe that over the time he spent with him, that part of it is like, I mean, as a fisherman, you're usually not even invited to follow a rabbi, period, let alone a rabbi that has such a following as Jesus. Or it could be the fact that Jesus has told his disciples right here in Luke 22, what we just got done reading, verse 30, right before what we read this morning, Jesus has said to them, You are going to rule with me. You are going to sit on thrones and rule with me, and you are going to judge Israel with me. That sounds awesome. Who doesn't want a throne? So this sifting, this shaking of Peter's faith is going to reveal why does Peter really trust Jesus? Because if it's all about sitting on a throne and ruling with somebody in some kingdom here and now, 
the crucifixion is going to demolish any idea of that. Where, were, where will Peter's faith fall? And he says to them, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Now, if I try and put myself in Peter's shoes, which is a little easier for me because of my namesake, then I would have heard Jesus saying this, and he would have said, Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And I would have interrupted him and been like, you said no, right? You told him no? Because if Satan has asked you, then why wouldn't you say no? If you have the power and the authority and the influence to say no, why won't you say no? It's interesting, the original Greek The forcefulness of the asking is almost like a demand. And some of the Bible translations render it like that. Satan has demanded to sift you as wheat. It brings really this question that is kind of a a mere image of what we talked about last week with Job chapter 1 and 2. Why does God choose to allow some forms of struggling and suffering? Why does God choose to do that? This has been an answer that has perplexed, I can't even talk right, an answer that has perplexed theologians for literally centuries. I do not have a really good answer that's going to sum it all up for you. But here's what I believe to be true. This is at least one factor in why God allows some suffering and struggling. Because I believe God knows each of us infinitely more intimately than our enemy does. He knows you and I infinitely more intimately. So a quick word about struggling and suffering. Some suffering is the result of free will human decisions. Some suffering just comes about because of free will decisions. And if we're honest, if we look in our own spiritual mirrors, we will realize that much, maybe most of our suffering is the the result of the decisions we have made with our own free will. We look at our own lives and go, ugh, idiot, right? We make poor decisions and we suffer. Sometimes, though, it is the free will decisions of other people that then bump into our lives. We've done nothing to deserve it, but other people get to make decisions just like we do, and then we suffer as a consequence. Now, some suffering is also just because uh, we read in Romans chapter 8, the creation is still subject to the presence of sin. So the creation is still under the burden. It is groaning, right? There is still something about uh, the world that is under the weight of sin. And so this is a lot about, I believe, the, the health issues and weather-related stuff. Creation is just under the blanket of sin still. So some of our suffering is poor decisions, sometimes our own. Some of it is just the general state of the world, still under the blanket of sin. But there are some suffering that, according to this passage, might be more of a direct influence from the spiritual forces of evil in the world. And I believe God looks at us, and he knows us infinitely more intimately, and he knows if we are ready to deal with those struggles and potentially even grow from the experience of those struggles. So Jesus gives them one word of warning. Satan has asked to sift you, but then he follows it up with three encouragements. It's almost as if he knows that this one word of warning is going to be a struggle. And so he then gives them three encouragements on the other side of that warning. He tells them that he will, they will be strengthened by prayer. He follows the recognition of this testing, and he says, I have prayed for you, Simon. We find this concept other places in Scripture that Jesus prays for his people. John chapter 17, Jesus has been praying for the disciples, and then he says in verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prays for you. I'm not going to pretend to even try and understand the fullness of that. Because it seems 
I, Jesus pray, I pray to Jesus. Jesus prays for me. I mean, we find it again in Hebrews chapter 7. Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. There have been many priests, speaking of the Jewish system of priesthood, since death prevented them from continuing office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood, and therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. I think about this concept and I feel a little bit like John the Baptist when Jesus approaches him and says, it's time for you to baptize me. And how does John respond? Whoa, no, no, this seems wrong. You should baptize me, right? And I read this idea that Jesus prays for me and I'm like, that's not how that works. I pray to Jesus. But it's clearly evident that Jesus lifts up his people in prayer and intercession because he is our priestly advocate. When we are being sifted, our friend and intercessor holds us up in prayer. What an amazing gift that is. And the strength that Peter receives from this prayer of Jesus is intended to prevent his faith from failing, that your faith may not fail. So, pop quiz. Did the prayer work? Does Peter's faith fail? I'm not going to ask you to answer out loud. Just ruminate on that a little bit. Marinate in that question. Does the faith of Peter fail? Maybe I'll ask the question this way. Is there a difference between faith that falters and faith that fails? Now, I would argue yes that there's a huge difference between faith that falters and faith that fails. And while being sifted, we may stumble, but our faltering faith does not make us failures. And I want to make that crystal clear today. Faltering faith does not make you a failure. I mean, think about this. If you've ever gone on a hike or even just a walk through the woods, do you consider it a failure anytime you trip or stumble or sit to rest or fall down? Of course not. That's not a failure. That's a setback on the way to finishing what you have laid out in front of you. Does Peter's faith falter without question in spectacular style? But does his faith fail? I would argue no. I would say that Peter's faith experiences a setback more than a point of no return failure. Jesus even says, when you turn back. Now, turning back assumes a turning away. But when you turn back, I find it interesting, not if, but when you turn back. Jesus expects Peter to falter, but not to fail. And if you know the rest of Peter's story, do you know what it is that brings Peter back, that helps him turn back? It's the experience of the resurrected Christ. I have to believe that the shame of what Peter did in his faltering of his faith, denying Jesus multiple times, that had to create a cloud of shame that was over top of him for a long time. However, he kept his eyes open that when the opportunity to see the power of the resurrected Christ appeared, Peter literally ran out of the boat, jumped into the water, swam to the shore to embrace his Savior. His faith faltered, but it did not fail. And Jesus told him, when you turn back, what, will then, what, what was Peter to do? To strengthen his brothers. When you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Our experiences of being sifted can not only strengthen our faith, but also enable us to strengthen the faith of others. The spiritual forces of evil in this world might shake our lives and maybe sometimes shake them violently. We may even fall down in the process, but when we are able to stand once again, we find that we are stronger and that we can then strengthen our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Now, a word of warning, when you start to go through suffering that might feel like sifting, do not immediately think, oh, how can I help someone else with this? No, survive first. Get through it first. Listen to what God is teaching you first. I mean, it's valiant to think of others immediately, but God needs to teach you before he uses you to strengthen other people when we go through our sifting. So that's the message Peter receives. Satan has asked to sift you, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail and that when you turn back and you are strengthened, you can strengthen your brothers. Now, when does the sifting start is kind of the question. I think for many of us, we envision the sifting gets started when Peter is following Jesus from a distance and warming himself by the fire and he starts saying, I don't know him. But I would argue the sifting actually started in the tail end of what we read this morning. Because when Jesus says, you're going to get sifted, I've prayed for you, you're going to turn back and strengthen your brothers, what does Peter say in response? Lord, I am ready to follow thee unto death if necessary. I think the sifting starts right there, immediately with that that declaration. Listen, Peter is passionate and decisive and confident right? And those are all generally really good character traits to have. I think we all want to follow leaders who are passionate and decisive and confident. And Peter is all those things to the point that when the opportunity comes on the day of Pentecost, who steps forward to preach? Peter does, seizes the opportunity, passionately delivers the gospel. And people come. Great character traits, great strengths. However, In this moment, in this episode, in this instance of sifting, I would argue that Peter's strengths are used by Satan against him. I might call it spiritual jujitsu. Anybody familiar with um, martial arts? I'm not. I wish I was. Um, as As a young man, as a boy, I really wanted to do some form of martial arts. But Let's be honest, any young man my age, I think we all wanted to do martial arts. I mean, how could you watch the karate kid and not want to go out and practice karate? You know, like crane kick that mean guy right to the... So I I don't know much about it, but what I do know is that many varieties of martial arts practice this discipline of using your opponent's strength against them so it works to your own advantage. Trying to get your opponent to be overconfident in his or her strengths that they make a move in their strength and then you use their momentum in order to give you an advantage. And that is what I see happening in the sifting of Peter, that he has such strength and his decisiveness and confidence and passion that Satan then uses that momentum and then turns it into his weakness. So what is it about you or me I preached a sermon a while back. I talked about we need to be watchful of our strengths. Yeah, we need to be really attentive to our weaknesses, right? But we need to be watchful of our strengths, that they are not turned into weaknesses and work against us. So a few things to think about as we finish our time together to sort of um, start digesting all of the truth and beauty that the Scripture has given us today. Here's the first one. Thank God that He knows you infinitely more intimately than the forces of evil that seek to sift you. Infinitely more intimately. God knows you and cares for you. Secondly, has your faith been stumbling or faltering lately? I want to remind you again, you are not a failure. Ask God to reveal the resurrection of power of Jesus in your life in order to encourage you to turn back, to turn around, to turn a new direction if you feel like you have been faltering lately. Third, looking back on your life, where might there have been some seasons of sifting? And what did you learn from those experiences that you can now use to strengthen someone else? When you turn back, strengthen one another. And then lastly, What are some of your strongest character traits? And how might those strengths be used against you during a time of sifting at the hands of the enemy? 
So take a moment or two to pray, to reflect, to think on these things, to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us during this time of silent reflection, and then I will close that time in just a moment with a word of prayer. God, today we're thankful that you are good and that your mercy endures forever. We're thankful that you know us infinitely more intimately than the spiritual forces of darkness and evil that seek to separate us from you and work against your kingdom principles in our lives. God, we rest in the fact that we are fully known by you and fully loved by you. We also want to be attentive to those times that you may be sifting us or allowing us to be sifted. Help us to acknowledge when that might be happening and what we might learn, how we might uh, be purified in the process. Because we know that you will not abandon us in the sifting. We are humble, Jesus, that you pray for us, that you lift us up, that you intercede for us. And that you accept us just as we are. With our falterings, our tripping, our falling down. That you can lift us up. That your goodness leads to repentance. And that you continue to lead us as we run the race and fight the good fight for you. We're thankful for all these things today, Jesus, in your name. Amen.